Movie restoration is the process of taking an old film and as the name suggests restoring it. This means it is cleaned of dust and dirt and fixed where larger damage like scratches, burns and tears have occurred. They also fix audio damage and faded film among many other tiny details. It is done mainly because over time films are naturally destructive and decay to a point of unwatchability. This process is also done so that a wider audience of people can have access to the film. It has become a more common process for restoring cult favourites, B-movies you've never heard heard of and cinematic classics, and the work and care that goes into it is almost an art form of its own. Restorations take great care in preserving the original intent and direction of films while improving their image and sound quality to a modern standard. As more and more films are restored, I wanted to make a video about what it really means to restore a film and why it is done. This is basically down to two reasons, to make money and to preserve a piece of film history much like a painting being framed. It mainly started in the 1980s when films were at risk of becoming lost due to preservation of nitrate film being a problem and safety film was also beginning to decay in a process called vinegar syndrome. It is estimated that 90% of silent movies before 1920 are lost and 50% of sound films made before 1950 are lost. So to unpack, let's start with nitrate film. Nitrate film base was the common film used for movies before the 1950s, but it was also a very dangerous and highly flammable chemical that would even burn submerged in water due to it consisting of a sufficient amount of oxygen to produce a fire. This led to it being banned from public transport in London and to be stored in fireproof rooms, and it was even the cause of several horrific fires that took many lives. Some of these same fires are the reason films were lost, combined with the discovery that the film would gradually decompose. It was found that storing the film in low temperature would indefinitely delay the reaction. Projectors were also installed with several fire extinguishers. Nitrate is pretty tricky. Uh, it is very combustible. Uh, basically, it is almost like gunpowder. There's none here on the lot. It is stored in an environment that is as safe as possible. Shipping nitrate is highly regulated from the packaging of it to the way that it is moved by truck. Once it came out here, it was a matter of bringing it into a facility that had all the permits that could use this material. Which brings the question of, if it was that dangerous, why not find another way? Which moves us on to the acetate film, better known as safety film, which didn't have a problem of being flammable, but was more expensive to produce and didn't do very well at multiple projections, and in terms of restorations began to decay due to vinegar syndrome, which occurred due to hot and moist conditions, and was the release of acetic acid from the celluloid onto its surface, causing it to be brittle and damaged. It would also shrink and buckle and develop crystalline deposits and fungi on the film. This would also occur after long storage times however, so it was still mostly a better solution, but another change was needed, which brings us to cellulose triacetate base film, which became the industry mainstay due to its matching the cost and durability of nitrate without being a fire hazard, but it was still subject to vinegar syndrome, so to preserve some films, they were transferred to a different film stock. However, once they had become brittle, they could not be transferred. It is still a popular choice of film to use today as it is very easy to splice compared to polyester, which would mostly replace it in the 80s, to some hesitation due to concerns of its strength being harmful to cameras and projectors if it got stuck, which proved partially to be an advantage of the long life of the film. Portions of those surviving reels were starting to deteriorate at the ends. So we were missing image in parts at the ends of certain reels. And again, we were lucky, I guess, to say uh, we had two second generation elements that were made right after the time the negative was made. So they were both nitrate, they were fine grains made in the 40s. So we had two of those to choose from as alternates where either footage was missing or footage was badly damaged. So we actually scanned all of it. So moving away from the film stock and onto the format they restore the film from. The film negative is handled with extreme care and is the information from behind the lens of the camera that picks up all the light it is exposed to. It looks the same as the negative camera effect on most phones and is the way the film looks once it has been chemically processed. They are very fragile to the extent that even a fingerprint can destroy them. They are the ultimate backup file that everything comes from making them extremely good for restorations except when parts are missing or damaged which is when 
other archive copies of the film and film elements will be edited in place. So you have the entire film on film start. The film is then ran for a scanner which will clean off some of the dust and dirt and take high resolution images of each frame of the film. Towards the beginning of this process pins will be used to stabilise this film but they would damage the film. Today we can use editing software to stabilise the image. We're using a Scanity. It's one of the safest machines we have in-house due to it not having any metal parts, metal sprockets, or any uh, pins registering the film. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hub, and it's completely safe for these older films, for these films with uh, problematic perfs. It's really, really good. Scanning is actually a relatively straightforward process with the modern scanners of today. They are not pin registered, so you're not really dragging the film through. There's not a physical intervention against the film. So it's handled very gently on these rollers that just sort of glide everything through. We're in scanning right now, and this is where it all starts. We have original camera negative loaded on the scanner. The scanner basically converts each and every film frame into a digital image at three times the actual resolution of the film. In some cases, if a scratch is deep or large, they will do a wet gate scan where in film it passes through a liquid bath and the scratch is filled in with the same emulsion the film is made of. Dealing with scratches, one of the best ways to eliminate those is to use what is known as a wet gate scan. What that involves is that the film, as it passes through the gate in the scanner, passes through a liquid bath. That liquid has the same uh, index of refraction as the film emulsion and therefore fills in the scratch and is not picked up by the scanner. So now you have every frame of the film digitally ready to be put into the editing software. What needs to be done now is the main restoration, which includes fixing pops and hisses in the audio, making sure audio continuity is sound and good, fixing the colour and contrast if it is faded, switching seamlessly between elements if one is too damaged, fixing burns, scratches, tears and any other damage, and a few more things. The removal of most tears, burns and scratches, and anything else similar, is done by looking at the frames of the film before and after the damage has occurred, and painting out the damaged frame with the intact information. For example, if there is a scratch on one frame and the next frame is fine, then you take the size of the scratch in detail from the next frame and put it over the top of the scratch. The standard frame rate of film is 24 frames per second, so that, for the most part, gives enough opportunity to cover any damage. Because the film fades over time, it also has to be restored as best as possible, usually by adding contrast to specific areas of the frame and the whole image. However, this can cause more grain to appear. Where the color has started to fade, one of our supervisors is working on a, an old Rock Hudson title called Pillow Talk, and that has severe fading, but they were able to isolate the layers that had faded and bring it back up to its original levels. There is an important balance to how much grain you want the restoration to have, as if it's too much it's unwatchable and if it's too little it will look off and wrong. It is done by reducing the film grain noise, which can be a delicate process. Then once or during the visual repair, the audio repair is done, which includes removing strange noises, pops and hisses, and making sure audio syncs and continuity is good, for example, not sped up or slowed down. For missing or broken music, they'll find a matching recording from another element or somewhere else, and very rarely they will re-record music. For the removal of pops and hisses, it is done in the editor by finding them in the audio file and removing them. As I'm going through, I can zoom in on various areas of the soundtrack and isolate pops, ticks, bumps, and individually clean up garbled piece where there's a speed change, you know, they call it wow. Fortunately, for this music cue existed in Spanish Dracula. So we were able to go back and find a, a matching piece of the same music with the same quality. We're not altering the filmmaker's vision 
but we are removing things that are detrimental to the experience, that may be distracting. The introduction of 4K streaming and physical media formats, the popularity of high quality restorations has massively increased, with people demanding restorations of all their favourites from the 80s and beyond. The process costs a lot of money to do, but I wanted to talk about it just briefly in as basic a way as I could, because I think it is important to preserve film history and present classic films to future audiences in the format they can enjoy. Anyway, Clarence. 293 uh, next May. That does it. Aren't you two pixies go through the door or out the window?